This is part four in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to repair this Rigel DP832 power supply. In the previous videos I went over what the fault is I'm trying to fix, which is a, a habit it developed of rebooting itself. It's something it's done since new, um, but it only used to do it once a week maybe, um, but it got to the point where it was doing it several times every minute and it was pretty much unusable. And um, uh, Dave Jones over at EV Blog uh, did a teardown of one of these uh, quite a few years ago now, in fact about the same time as I bought this, uh, which is actually about six years ago now, seven years ago, it's older than I uh, thought it was. And um, he found that there was a 5 volt regulator that was getting extremely hot and I found the same thing in this one and it was getting close to the thermal shutdown um, temperature of that uh, particular device. However, after quite a lot of experimentation and uh, modifying this machine to keep that uh, device cooler, uh, I found that that wasn't the cause of the fault. It might be a secondary cause, it could be on some machines. It is getting hot enough to um, cause the uh, machine to reset, but that's not what was the primary cause here. And uh, I did, however, modify it. I replaced the heatsink with a bigger one, replaced the capacitors, I also replaced the regulator as well. Um, but that didn't stop it uh, resetting itself, it was still uh, rebooting and it was getting uh, gradually worse again. And uh, it uh, turned out, as in the previous video, that the fault appears to be on the actual digital control board. And um, I think it's, it's, it's poor design on the part of Rigel, they haven't properly tested this, they haven't gone through and uh, properly understood the spec sheet for the processor that they're using. So just to recap on something I showed in the previous video, uh, this is the um, flowchart, the block diagram of the power handling part of the processor. And it's an iMX28 that they're using. Uh, but it's meant really for battery powered devices, so it's got uh, inbuilt or integrated support for lithium ion batteries. Now, in defense of Rigel, this is out of the um, spec sheet and uh, design guide for that uh, range of processors. And it's, it's kind of misleading, it's, it's quite complex how this thing works internally, but um, Looking at it like this, you'd expect if you apply a 5 volt uh, supply, which is how the Rigel's configured, then the 5 volt is used to directly power um, the uh, daisy chain of regulators. There's quite a few rails on this device um, going from 3.3 volts, which these are adjustable by the way, 3.3, uh, 1.8 and 1.55 volts and then there's a secondary 1.5 volt and these are used internally in the device as well as externally uh, for various peripherals. But this is not really how it works uh, in terms of the noise um, characteristics of the device. It would have been better if they had have changed this and make a slight modification to this it's better to view it like that. So really what happens is the 5 volt comes in, it goes through the DC to DC converter, may be used to uh, charge a battery through the battery charger. The sense for the, the sense voltage for this converter is taken from these connections, not from the 5 volt. The 5 volt is used to detect if there is 5 volts present but only so it can switch over to the battery. Um, but really you need to view it in terms of the device is always powered from the 4.2 volt rail which is through here. And that is available externally. And this is the line that needs the extra capacitors putting on. But, uh, originally there's only one small 0402 size capacitor and it was arranged like that and that's nowhere near enough even in the next few pages of this data sheet it explains um, in some detail how to um, apply the decoupling to the various rails and that wasn't done on this Rigel machine 
and that's what was causing the problem. This rail was extremely noisy. There was about two volts of noise on this rail. So the modification I ended up doing was to fit some additional decoupling capacitors and um, that seems to have completely cured it. I can't say for absolutely certain yet that this is fixed um, but this project has now caught up to real time. The last video was shot on Thursday, it's now Sunday morning. So this has been running continuously for now over three days and it hasn't reset once whereas it was resetting uh, once every few minutes, um, no more than every couple of hours, uh, but it's been now running. This is the longest it's ever run since I got it uh, without it resetting. So I'm starting to become confident that it's uh, we're getting close to a fix, if not um, already fixed. Uh, the next step is to get this reassembled and to um, essentially get it back onto a full test. And I'll leave it running uh, pretty much indefinitely. I'll just leave it switched on. Uh, I don't really intend to use this supply. I, I may bring it back into service, but at the moment I don't intend to use it anymore. Um, but I will leave it running. And uh, the only reason really for using this now is to test it to see if this uh, fix actually worked. Um, really to help anyone else that's got one that wants to repair theirs. Uh, so I'll get this reassembled. Before I do that, just give some information as to what the modification was in case you want to do the same thing on yours. Uh, normally I don't give details of uh, the work that I do on this channel. I've always said that um, you know, really I want people to experiment and, and do it their own way rather than the way I do it. And in fact I got a, um, a comment on one of my previous videos yesterday from some clown who um, basically said I'm leaving you thumbs down because uh, you didn't give me accurate dimensions of the part you made uh, and I think you may be uh, lying to everyone. Or something to that effect. Uh, I've got no reason to um, try and deceive anyone. I'm trying to help here. Um, so if you respond like that, I'll probably just block you. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is, is actually help someone. I've got this channel's not monetized. I don't make any money from doing this. This is just purely to try and help out. Um, but on this occasion, because this is a, a specific fix, I will try and give a bit of information as to exactly what the fix was. So firstly, I did fit a larger heatsink and I replaced the um, capacitors and the regulator. The regulator was still working but because it had been so hot for so long it was most likely going to fail soon. Okay so this has been going for three days. I'm going to turn it off now so I can get it reassembled but as I said it hasn't reboot once in uh, three days. So that's looking extremely promising. Okay so I'll just spin this round so that you can see uh, inside and I'll try and explain what I did and I'll just zoom the camera in so you can have a closer look. Okay so the modification is in this area and um, the key thing to look for you can actually do this modification without taking the board out if you want to. Um, everything you need is on the back of the board. If you want to look at the rail and to see how noisy it is with a scope or a meter then it's on this uh, top end of this diode so where the pen tip is uh, that's the point where the 4.2 volts is on this side of the board. Uh, this yellow capacitor you can see is one of the capacitors I added. Uh, you probably can't see them very well, they're all surface mount um, 0603 parts apart from this 08 part. Um, but what I've done, I've done a, a quick uh, Dave Cad sketch of um, this area. I did try and take some um, high resolution photos and I had the board out but they uh, haven't come out very well, the focus is not really very good. So. Um, Hopefully you can see what I've done here. Um, no real modifications to the board itself apart from to scrape away a bit of the, uh, the uh, solder mask. But um, I'll say, well, have a look at the sketch that I did and hopefully it will make it a bit clearer as to the modification. Okay, so this is how the board is arranged originally. You've got this large diode, that's the one I pointed out a minute ago. And uh, the only capacitor that's on this 4.2 volt rail is the small 0402 part. And I suspect what's happened here, and the reason it got progressively worse, is this small capacitor is doing all the work of trying to filter out that switching. And as I said, it's, um, the main power is coming through this 4.2 volt rail for the entire processor, even though it shows in the data sheet that the power should in theory be coming from the 5 volt rail. That's not really how this device works internally. So 
this capacitor would have been under a huge amount of stress and has probably failed, which is why it was uh, getting progressively worse. Uh, having said that, this is nowhere near up to the job anyway. It needs far more um, decoupling than, than this. So the modification I made, is you could see, there was a large um, yellow capacitor, and that was here. So that was a 33 microfarad capacitor. So all I did was scrape away the solder mask all the way along this area. So I just scraped all that away. And the same on this side, I just scraped away an area of solder mask. So I soldered a 33 microfarad capacitor there, a 10 nanofarad capacitor there, a 1 and a 100. So that's all I did. That's the entire modification. I did, as I say, change the heat sink, but that's a secondary uh, thing. That's just really uh, good um, uh, design practice, really, to get that uh, regulator a bit cooler. Uh, but this is all it needed, and I, don't, I really don't know why Rigel didn't do this. There's plenty of space there. It would have cost them probably two or three pence to add these parts, and they are really called for in the uh, spec sheet of the processor. So this is just a poor design on the part of Rigel, but even more annoyingly is the fact that they didn't respond um, and get this uh, done uh, much more quickly than they did. Now, I appreciate there's a lot of inertia, in overseas manufacturing. They probably had 100,000 or more of these boards that they'd made in the first batch. Um, but even so, it's their responsibility if they're going to sell an expensive supply like this to get this sorted out. So if you want to make a modification, it'll probably take you about half an hour. Um, you don't need to use surface mount if you don't want, but it, they do work better in this application uh, because obviously they're much more closely coupled to the board. And um, it is a bit of a challenge soldering these on. They are small and the uh, entire ground plane is obviously going to uh, make it difficult to solder. So it's probably easier if you scrape away the solder mask, uh, tin the surface first with some solder uh, and then uh, apply the capacitors. And um, let's say if you want to probe this area uh, with a scope, that's effectively what I was showing on the scope in the previous video. Um, so what I'll do now is get this assembled, just make sure it works, and then it can be put back on to long-term test. And of course, if anything uh, shows up on it as still been faulty, I will do a, a, another follow-up video. Um, but we'll finish this video off by having a look at the uh, reassembled unit. Okay, well, there's the unit reassembled. Hopefully, it's a permanent fix. It will be interesting to hear from you, uh, any comments on uh, how long you think um, this should now run before it can be deemed to be repaired. Um, so any feedback would be appreciated. Um, a message to Rigel, these only mean something if you do your design properly, otherwise these are not worth the piece of plastic they're printed on. Okay, if anyone thinks I'm being harsh on Rigel here, um, just bear in mind that this is something that uh, Rigel have been aware of since probably 2014 if not earlier. Uh, Dave Jones did a video on this, um, flagging up this uh, fault back in 2014, which is about when I bought this. I reported this as a fault, numerous other people have reported this, uh, and yet the fault uh, has persisted and Rigel haven't done anything about it. It's poor design and um, it's something that really they should have got sorted out and got on top of uh, very quickly. Uh, but they just carried on selling these supplies irrespective of the fault that was present. So uh, I, as I can't say for sure this has fixed the fault, but certainly it's been going now for several days without any issues. As I say, feedback would be uh, appreciated, but um, let's see how this goes. And fingers crossed it's uh, going to behave itself. But as I say, I won't be using this as my uh, main lab supply anymore. I've lost all uh, faith in it. It's ruined um, hundreds of experiments and it's, uh, to all intents and purposes, the way it was sold, it's absolutely useless as a bench supply for any uh, serious work. Um, can't say for sure if this fault still exists in the current units. It was fairly uh, intermittent on these units when they were first brought out. Uh, 
but it shouldn't have happened. The, the design is fundamentally flawed uh, in a fairly uh, silly way and it's something that uh, I'm surprised a company like Rigel uh, didn't do something about this very quickly. Uh, you can't have a supply like this that behaves in a, a random manner. It uh, completely defeats the entire point of having a high quality bench supply. So in the next video we'll have a look at what I'm replacing this with. Um, probably be a bit of a surprise um, to most of you but uh, as I say I do a lot of work um, needing a, a decent supply and this is no longer uh, deemed uh, as far as I'm concerned to be fit for purpose.